says it's not a curse. It's supposed to be a blessing. And um, so get back on. So back now to King David. What happens is King David, Saul gets killed. Okay, he actually kills himself, which I don't blame him. Even though he committed suicide, he didn't go to hell. Some people said, well, if you commit suicide, you go to hell. No, the Bible doesn't say that. It is the sin of murder, but it's also, there's demons, there's all sorts of things. However, the reason he committed suicide was they were about to kill him and cut his head off. Or drag him and poke his eyes out. So it was, you know, it was a foregone conclusion that he was on the way out, right? So, so he just lost his son. He fell falls on his own spear but then this guy comes for a few bucks right and goes to David and what does he say to King David I killed him thinking that King David would be thrilled that this guy killed his enemy what does King David do killed him and why do you remember what he said to him when he killed him that's right who are you to touch the Lord's anointed. And yet David was anointed. See, so we have, see, that's in life. There's the spiritual authorities. See, in the spirit realm, no male, no female. Right? No Jew, no Greek. Okay, in the natural realm, on the earth, there's a Jew, and he's connected to Israel. Now, I'm a spiritual Jew, and I can love Israel, but in the spirit realm, we're all Israel. Okay, we're all under Abraham. We're all, we're all together in Isaac. And Isaac is actually Jesus. We're all together there. And uh, so those are the, so that's why you have to know all your authorities. So there's a spiritual authority. So that's why when the woman is praying for her husband, she's not violating because see her husband is not her spiritual authority. Right? Her husband is not her spiritual head. God is your spiritual head. She's part of the body. So she, she, in the, she goes to the king of kings. All it is is in a natural order of things that God has. And again, even as you teach it, the concept of Old Testament husband and wives to New Testament husband and wives is again a big concept change where Jesus is, is trying to say you're joint heirs and, you know, but respect each other. And so he's teaching a whole, whole lot of things that are more in attitudes. But I'm talking authority, okay? Not attitudes. You understand the difference when I'm when I'm saying that? So let's go down to Acts chapter three. So the reason we're um, and I was going to carry on was resist the devil, but I it's been coming to me just to talk a bit about the name of Jesus. And the reason we're carrying on with these teachings, you can come or not come. I'm really glad and honored to have you here. But I believe right now we're in a very special time in the spirit. I really believe. And I, it's like to me, I'm, and I have some other special teachings that I'm documenting this stuff. This, Because I believe there's a group of people going to come, maybe in six months, six years. I have no idea. But I believe there's going to be a group of people coming, and just like I was, hungry for the word. And, and we're, what we're doing is canning, practicing. We're, we're picking the berries, sticking them in a can. We're being encouraged. Most of you all know the word. I'm not teaching you a whole lot of new things, but we're being refreshed in the word. Um, I'm not maybe teaching anything new if you've been around here or if you've studied anything. But what we're doing is we're creating a place where we're going to package this thing so someone can come in, they can get a hold. If someone could just get a hold of the authority teaching right then, all of a sudden, I almost plan most of my business things, everything by authority. I stop and I think, okay, now where's the authority operating here? And I watch in the authority. Most churches are in trouble because they're not operating under the authority. The Bible tells you how God does it. Right? And, and see, then there's the larger body. Like one time, I was going to get three men. They were spiritual giants, in my estimation. And I was going to make them elders because that was a little teaching going around. But I was so glad the Holy Spirit stopped me just in time. And he said to me, he said, now those three men that were in the church back then at that time, they're all good, godly men. He said, now those three men get along? No. None of them got along with each other. Now they were Christians, and they would have prayed for each other, cared for each other, but their personalities were contrary to each other. So see, that would have been a real smart thing, bringing them in and, and whatever. So see, that's why there's elders in the community, and the Lord began to say, no, see, this one's an elder in the community. He has his own Bible school, and he's doing this. This person is an elder in your church. So this particular person, you could just tell, they love Selwyn Outreach Center. 
The other one was coming to Selwyn Outreach Center to be committed on Sundays to a church, but his vision and ministry was out here in a, in a Bible school, and this other person was a pastor and had, had troubles being a pastor and had come to our church and always wanted me to let him preach, but the Holy Spirit always said, watch him, and I'd watch him in service, and he was reading his Bible. Well, see, I'm not going to let someone stand in that pulpit if they're not listening to this boy. Because, see, if you're not listening to this boy, he's not here because he's Brian Mahood. He's here because God called him and appointed. So that shows me that that's why he, he didn't survive in his church, right? Because he didn't have a teachable attitude. And he went on afterwards and went somewhere else and wasn't happy there and then started his own little group of whatever, 10 or 12 people that basically taught that, because he came out finally, that he basically believed that if you're English, that was the new Israel and... Uh, it's called the old teaching was British Israelism, where the promised land is Israel. Uh, the promised land is Britain. Look, at the promised land is Florida. <laughs> or somewhere down south. It can be further south. It doesn't have to be Florida, but it's definitely warmer. And, uh, but see, this was a whole teaching. Well, see, I didn't know all that stuff that came out years later. But see, it wasn't that the person was a bad person. They were a strong, dedicated, caring Christian. But they had an agenda over here. This person had a vision over there. So when you have leaders in your church, and if you look at our uh, elders and leaders uh, that are here, these are people that they want to see this church succeed. They want to see us. And so we're, then that's how you get your unity going. And then that's how we work. And if you're in unity, then you're, you can do a lot of things wrong and God will still... Work it out okay, all right? So um, he, here what we have is, uh, see, I like this because this tells me why then when I'm battling the world, I've got to battle the world because I'm not of the world. I can't have friendship of, with the world, but I am in the world. So that's why we're reminding ourselves in here that that's why attacks come on you. Almost all attacks will come from the world. Almost all attacks on the Christians will come from the world. Because the world has authority to attack us in the flesh. All right? And if we don't affect our world, where they start to believe that what God says, they'll affect us in, in the next 10, 15 years. Things will not be allowed to be preached from the pulpit. Pe preachers will go to jail for teaching the word. Okay? Because it'll soon be declared somewhere along, if it's not in Canada, somewhere else. And Canada is the forerunner in almost every area. So... Canada is under tremendous grace time right now, and God can turn it around, but Canada is a forerunner in almost every um, low-level uh, endeavor. Okay, finally, they, I think finally did bring the legal age of kids up to 16, didn't they? Did they finally bring that up? But Canada even had a, made it easy, 14 for, for a child, all that stuff going on. Um, I'm not against Canada, I'm for Canada, but I'm just saying that's in the world, and the world's going to think like the world thinks. Then we have the devil, and that's what this tells us, if I submit unto God, I resist the devil. God doesn't resist the devil, he's resisted the devil. I resist the devil. If I don't, resi if I don't resist the devil, he does not have to flee. Hello? Now, he doesn't have a right to live on my land, but there's, in the, in the world, there's what they call... Um, People that move on to land they don't own. Yeah. Pardon? Squatters, right? And he has squatters' rights. What's the right of the squatter? To stay there until you kick him off. <laughs> this is a true story. A guy was just telling me today about in Toronto, the laws are, of course, that you can't kick someone out of your apartment, certainly in the winter, even if they're not paying their rents. And, of course, the other thing is that it says that, you know, because a lot of people lie about saying they're going to pay their rent and don't pay, or they damage, and it's very hard to get people out in the present laws of Canada or Ontario, and I understand why. But what this guy was telling me, a loophole in the law, was that you can't force people out, but you can bring other people in, and I want to find out if that's true. <laughs> so what he, he, this particular landlord in Toronto has a couple of biker buddies, and whenever people can't pay their rent, he just goes in and says, well, I can't kick you out, but I can have other people come in. So they're going to come in, and they're going to just kind of rent a rumor here from you. And they said, it's amazing how many people are gone within a couple of days. <laughs> no, I don't know. That. I don't even know that that's legally true. But, it, you know, it could be because 
the law does talk about not moving out. I don't know how you just move in. So anyways, I thought, well, that's the way. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's interesting. So submit unto God. I have to resist the devil. And then he has to flee. Okay. Now what you might say, well, pastor, it doesn't seem like he's fleeing. Well, then just stand. Because the Bible, if you've resisted the devil, right? It's not like I dare you. The devil's not going. I double dare you. I double dog dare you, devil. Right? So if we told him to go, and if he doesn't go, stand. Or check out if I'm submitting to God. Right? Holy Spirit, if I'm not submitting to you, will you tell me in a hurry? All right? And... Um, that's right. That's a very good time to check your authority. Because see, people think that rebellion in one area doesn't affect you in another area. So where you're rebellious, see, you know, again, it says... Now, I'm not talking about in home. Sometimes people are just in disagreement for a lot of things. But if you're in unity with that person and you're, you're doing the right thing towards that person, they can't, if your heart's right, they can't hinder your prayers. They can hinder your prayers together. The things that you're going to do together, they can hinder. Okay? But if you're in right place of authority, if they're not, don't think that you're going to be, you'll be hindered, but you will not be stopped. Okay? Um, and the reason you're hindered is just because you don't have anybody in agreement and you're fighting a, 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 a battle in the, in the zone. Um, so we resist the devil and he will flee. And so that's when we stand, having done all, stand. But if there's still more to do, do it. And then the third thing again is, and I love this, if when we have time we'll go to Romans where Paul says, I got two people go fighting in me. I got the flesh me and the real me. And Paul totally says the real me is me, but there's a flesh me that's so close, he ticks me off, right? And he says, even Paul, which personally this scripture at times in my life has given me a lot of encouragement, that even Paul said, I do the things I don't want to do, right? And uh, so that, see, it's not... It's not, we shouldn't rejoice that other people have trouble, but sometimes it's nice to know we're not the only one that has trouble. Amen? So he, but he clearly in Romans says that he's the inner person. He's got his mind and, and he's in a battle. And then he goes into Romans 8 and 1, which we, we may go to. But here we're going to go tonight to Acts chapter 3 and just do this first part and then stop. So that's what we're doing. I appreciate you being out here, but we're just, to me, we're canning we're canning things in the spirit, putting them in so that when the hungry people come, there we, we won't have to be teaching all the time. Because see, if a, a certain kind of move comes, some moves can be so God, all we want to do is just worship God. You know, people just come in and worship God and get healed and be touched. And okay, then they'll still have a hunger for the word because the spirit will never push the word out. But the spirit can sometimes have a season for doing certain things. So um, Acts chapter 3, we're going to go to verse 12 to 16. We talked about this in reference last week. And it says this. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the man is healed at the temple. Beautiful. Um, he wasn't thinking about Jesus, this man. Uh, let me just go back and read that. Okay, now Peter, in ver chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Okay, so that is um, 6 o'clock plus 9 hours is uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Um, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried to whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them who entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Okay, so Peter's saying he had something, right? And he's saying it's as tangible as money, right? And in Hebrews chapter 11, on Sunday nights, we've been teaching faith is substance. The hope for and the evidence. So it's substance and evidence not in this realm. Because I cannot see your faith that's in your heart today. There's not one of us. 
I can see it by your actions. If you're a tither, I can tell you you have faith in tithing. See, if you're a joyful person and, and always rejoicing, I can tell you have faith in God. Because someone who's faith in God is not grumpy all the time. They're rejoicing most of the time. So I can tell by outside actions what's on your, in your heart generally, but I can't see into your heart. But it says now faith is a substance, so it's substance and it's evidence. As we said before, evidence in a courtroom is something somebody can grab, touch, feel, examine. So in our world, we cannot grab, touch, feel, and examine faith. In God's world, he can grab, touch, and feel faith. Right? So it's evidence to God and it's substance to God. Matter of fact, it says it's the substance the worlds were made from through the word of God. And so here he thinks he has substance. So he says, I have something. I have something. I have something. So you and I have to get to the place where we realize we have something. If we don't realize we have something, we can't give it even if we have it. But if I realize I have something, then I can give it. All right? And so he says, and here's what he had. He had the name of Jesus. He didn't talk about faith here. See, he just, this is a man who probably didn't hear much about Jesus because Jesus had gone in and out of that temple. I don't know what was wrong with this guy. I can never understand why during the time of Jesus' ministry, this guy did not go somewhere where there's a miracle service and been healed. But it shows you that when miracles are happening everywhere, there's somebody not hearing, not even knowing something. So he's still at the temple. Jesus is gone. And, and he says, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, because there's many Jesuses, Jesus the anointed one of Nazareth, because again, it's the same word as Joshua. In the name of Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Then he took him by the right hand, that's Peter, okay, and lifted him up. Now it tells me that Peter here had either a gift of faith come on him or an insight into that person. Now, some people teach that that man had faith because he was expecting to receive. I don't know whether that's true. He certainly didn't have faith in healing because he was expecting to receive money. And he didn't get what he was expecting to receive. Right? However, can an expectant attitude in somebody open you up to things? I think it can. Right? So I think if you expect to have a good day, the likelihood of you seeing the good things in your day goes way up to you expecting it's going to be a bad day. So we know it couldn't have hurt him, but we don't, I don't know that it helped him or whether this was a miracle moment, but clearly something was happening here and some can teach it way better than I am. I'm just telling you what it says there. I'm not telling you really what on on. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. Okay. Grabbed him by the right hand, and he lifted him up. That meant he he used his strength to lift him up. He didn't. It wasn't like Jesus said, "Lift up your bed, take up your bed, and walk." Okay, he lifted him up, and immediately, when when did his body get better? Immediately, immediately after what? He lifted him up. So see, I would say this is Peter operating in faith. But the other man is in a place of openness. And see, that's why you can get so many results in a hospital. If you go in there and start praying for people, because they're looking for health. They're already sick. They're looking for an answer. They're looking for someone to come through that door and give them something that's going to get them out of that hospital. So people that will never be open to prayer will often be open to prayer when they're in a crisis or in a hospital. Why? Because they're looking for anything that will get them out of there. They've had enough of those open back gowns. You know, enough of people sticking things in every part of them. Okay? And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And then, of course, he went leaping and jumping and, and all that. Now we go to verse 12. So now they're inquiring of Peter. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why are you amazed at this? And why do you look so earnestly on us as though... By our own power or holiness, we made this man to walk. So whose power? Was it Peter's power? Good. 
Peter's a good guy. He's already preached the greatest message, one of the greatest sermons. But the fact that he's a good guy, called of God, a sh you know, a shepherd, he wasn't taking on the pressure of getting this man healed. Peter's saying, it's not my power, right? And it's not my holiness, right? So if you and I could realize Peter knew it wasn't him that was doing it, he was obeying, okay? And we do think there was a reason for this. And why marvel you at this? Or why do you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Now we're talking about authority. So now we're back on authority. We, in a minute we'll, we'll understand the authority in the name of Jesus. But here we're saying the God of Abraham, okay, and Isaac and Jacob. So that means that he's the God of this man who's sick. Right? And the Bible says that we're blessed in faithful Abraham. And so, remember Jesus said, this, this uh, what does he say, this daughter of Abraham who Satan has bound these 18 years? Right? Remember that scripture? So, when he said this daughter of Abraham, was he just saying this Jewish lady? No, he was calling to the fact that this woman is a descendant of faith and she's a descendant of covenant. And what does the covenant to Abraham say? You're supposed to be blessed. And I'll take a little side trip to mention this. Curse is not sin. Okay, the curse of the law is poverty, sickness, and death. But curse is not good. And curse is not fun. And curse is not blessing. So when someone is sick, it's a curse, but not necessarily sin. Sin might have taken them to it, or it was it originally came out of sin. All curses came out of sin, but you're, you're not necessarily, because you're under a curse, does not necessarily mean you're under sin. Poverty is not a blessing, it's a curse. But being poor is not a sin. Have you ever heard that, being poor is not a sin? It's not, it's not, so, or else the whole world, the most of the world would be sinners because they're poor. No, they're sinners because sin. Right? But it's a curse. Okay? And sickness is a curse. And, and poverty is a curse. And so Jesus said, what's this daughter of Abraham doing cursed? And he was using the authority of she's, she has a right to blessings. And you and I sometimes need to go and say, God, I have a right to a blessing here. It's not God holding me back. It's something else. My wrong thinking. It might be a spiritual attack. God, I've been a giver and I expect to receive because you told me I'd receive. And so I'm telling you, I believe your word and declare those things that, that are true. Because why? Because the word gives you the power to say it. You are not lying when you say it. If God said, you can say it. Because you're not saying it into this earthly realm where it might appear to be a lie. You're saying it into the spiritual realm. Jesus said about Lazarus, he said he sleeps. And yet then the Bible says he was dead. Well, was Jesus lying? Because the word he used there for sleep wasn't die, dead or else his disciples would have known. the word Because they said, Lord, if he sleepeth, everything will be fine. Right? But he was keeping his confession right on the earth saying he was asleep, even though he knew he was dead. Why? Because in Jesus' mind, he was asleep. And he's about to be waking up. He, or else Jesus lied. And then they kept going, but Lord, if he's asleep, everything will be fine. He's dead. So in other words, it wasn't a big deal to Jesus to raise him from the dead, but yet he wasn't going around filling their minds. He wasn't trying to fill their minds with questions and, and all those things, right? So that just makes sense. And, uh, and so we have here now um, uh, these guys and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So I have some rights under Abraham. I have some rights under, God, under Jesus. I do. Okay? The God of our fathers hath glorified his son whom you delivered up, denied him in the presence of Pilate and then he was determined to let him go. So you guys stopped Pilate from letting him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. So you guys had stinking thinking, right? But, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, 
Wherefore you, we are witnesses. Now, verse 16, and his name, remember we talked about this last week, just touched on it, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. So Peter's not saying my prayer did it. He's not saying I did it. He's not saying my holiness did it. He's saying I have something. See, he, I have something. So when he had something, he saw the name of Jesus as a tangible in the spirit realm, a tangible weapon of God. And so he took that tangible weapon of God, but now we go to the authority. See, there's two authorities operating in the scripture. There's the name of Jesus. Why is the name of Jesus got authority? Pardon? It's above all names. High above all things, right? And everything that is named under heaven. So whatever this disease is, it had a name. And it was named under heaven. So the name of Jesus was above all that name. So that was the one authority. The second authority, which was by faith in this name, that couldn't have worked a hundred years before Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't here to have faith in his name. Right? And so we also know it couldn't have worked if, if just the name of Jesus had authority because the name of Jesus had authority before this man was healed, right? The name of Jesus had authority because the name of Jesus didn't get more authority or less authority than it already had. So there's two authorities operating here. There's the authority of Jesus and the name of Jesus and the power that's in the name. But then there's a second authority and that's where we're missing it. It's where he says, mixed with faith. That we have to mix God's word with faith to get what we want. And so here clearly he says, I mixed the authority of the name of Jesus, which tells me, in my name, you will lay your hands on the sick. Did he lay his hands on them? Yeah. It says he took them by the right hands. Right? And so he had some evidence some authority from Jesus to do this. So he had this authority and then he switches around and whose faith was it? His faith. It wasn't Jesus' faith. It was his faith. So he came around and he believed that that name was going to turn things around. So it says by, by the name, through faith in this name, okay, by um, whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is... Where, where, where am I? 16. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know, yes, the faith which is by him that giveth him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So now it goes on to say, the faith which is by him... By who? Jesus. So this faith which was by him hath given him his perfect, this perfect soundness. Okay? I believe that's by him, by Jesus. I would assume it is. Because there's two hymns here. Uh, and has given him perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So um, the faith here now, again, how did how did Peter get the faith to apply it to the authority of the name. Does someone have another version of the Bible just so we can see how they translate that? Yeah, because it says uh, elsewhere, it is Jesus' name and faith that comes from the Lord. Yeah. That's right. So what we have is we have the illegal authority of the name of Jesus. And then you have me coming in. That's similar to Gord. Okay. Gord, I'm using him as a policeman. He has the law that's established over Canada, not by a policeman, not by a lawyer, but by the Parliament of Canada. Okay. So he has a law that's established. Okay. So by the authority of this law, by my faith that you're breaking this law, because I see you with that bag of money walking out of this bank. Okay? So I exercise my authority as a police officer to exercise that authority to 
bind you in the name of Canada. All right? Now, how did he get the faith? How did Peter get the faith to do that? He got it from Jesus. So even the faith comes from Jesus to use the authority, but we have two different dynamics. That's why the Word and the Spirit have to work together. If we can get the Spirit and the Word working together in a church service, then all of a sudden the dynamics multiply. If we can get unity working, which allows the Spirit of God to work, then things start to happen. That's how the principles of, of, of God work. But God gives us the faith, but if we don't use the faith that we have to believe the Word, so I have to use the faith that's been given to me to, as it were, attack the Word, right? So I have to reach my faith into the Word and pull the Word into me. And in this case, he pulled the Word um, down into this man. And it's supposed to be a whole lot easier than we think. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you that, that we're learning your Word. And there's Peters here tonight. And there's female Peters and there's men Peters. And in our hearts, we know now, again, they didn't do this to every sick person. They didn't just walk to every sick person. But we know inside, every one of us here, you wouldn't be in this teaching if you didn't know in your heart that people are supposed to get better and receive deliverance and receive help through the name of Jesus. And so as we set our, our faith on the fact that Jesus' name is above all names, and that's why we have to have faith in that, we, we expect, every one of us, expects to use our faith in the name of Jesus to bring a healing and a cure to people that need it. So, Father, we just lift up our hands to you again tonight, and we say these hands are your hands. These feet are your feet, Lord. We're going to go the places you call us to go. We don't know what door we're going to walk out. We don't know what lame man is going to be beside us when we walk out some door. We don't know what circumstance is going to be beside us when we walk through a door. But all of a sudden, out of our mouth, we'll know we've got something to give. And we'll just turn around and give it to that person. And they're going to receive it. And then, Lord, we're just going to receive it with them. Because that's what Peter did. He kind of received it with him and brought, and brought him forth into his victory. So, Lord, we're going to give people a hand up to, to, get, into their, to get into their victory. Amen. And I just want you right now to picture yourself coming out of that temple. If you don't feel like being Peter right now, just be John and at least get a, a, a ringside seat. And we're going to walk out of that door. There's all these dear, dear people there begging, calling, you know, we're actually walking in, I guess, calling, calling for money. And somehow we say, oh, there it is. Jesus wants to bring forth freedom. And we just see ourselves reaching down and grabbing that person by their hand and saying, I didn't have, have any money with me today, but I've got something for you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Come on. Get up. Come on. I'll help you up. Come on. See, it wouldn't be wrong for us to imagine those things and keep our imagination. Because almost all of us have seen that happen in our lives. There's hardly anybody here that hasn't laid their hands on people and seen them healed. What happened is you started laying your hands on people sometimes and they weren't all healed and they got a little discouraged. So we're confessing that to the Lord. Lord, maybe I got discouraged, maybe I got frustrated, I got tired, got hurt, got whatever. But Lord, we're just confessing that to you. We're ready to believe strong again. We're ready to use our mouth.